Well, this has been bow hunting for me for the past couple weeks. This is the backyard. This is where all my practicing has been. Getting ready for that Monday opener, October 1st, the opener of bow hunting season for deer in Michigan. One thing you have to do when you bow hunt is practice. This is maybe not quite as easy as shooting a rifle. It involves a lot of skill and technique and strength. That's a little bit high. I need some more practice. Well, that's what this is all about before the season opener. And that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna talk about deer, deer hunting, bow hunting, equipment, archery, so you stay tuned. We're getting ready for bow season. I'm Fred Trost, it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Much, much better. That's how I should shoot every time. But you know, archery by itself is a lot of fun. I enjoy getting out and practicing, but there's nothing quite like bow hunting for deer. Up at bow camp, we've been to several bow camps on Michigan Outdoors. Always a lot of fun, whether it's a rustic setting uh, in a cabin, in a lodge, or in tents like we did up at Houghton Lake. The kind of people you meet, the stories you talk about are just great. That turn off where you go back in, about four or five hundred yards back into the left back in there. Mm -hmm. We're sitting back in there and, and all of a sudden we heard the snap and a crackle and here came seven, two bucks, five does, nice ones. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, said we'd sit around and wait to see them go out through and came back the next morning and there they were, right where we parked the truck. No shots, it was still too dark. But uh, uh, Gary King, story of my life. Hard luck story. story of my life. Yeah. Right? Nothing but hard luck stories, yeah. but that's okay, isn't it? It's fine, just to be here is a pleasure. Sure is. How you doing, Sam? Not too bad, Fred. You uh, got any uh, shots yet? Not yet, but still working at it. What Trying to stay about? dry. No shots at this time. No, I've been seeing them, but they haven't been coming in. Haven't been coming in. What about you, Jim? No shots. I've uh, seen well, several then, deer. Then what are we doing here? People are going to say, you know, we've been here almost four or five days. Well, we're waiting for a good shot. We're not, we're not, we don't want these long shots and end up with wounded animals and that type of thing. We're waiting for the good shots. Okay, that's, well, that's, that's, these guys are good bow hunters. That's where they shoot. That's where they hunt. That's where we do it. Well, we did have every well, archer has his or her favorite type of equipment, whether it's the tips, the arrows, the fletching, the bow, the bowstring, finger tabs, <laughs> the type of arm guard, the camouflage. Everybody has their own. We do a lot of discussion about this among bow hunters. But, you know, if you're just getting into the sport of bow hunting, you'll probably be like Mike Ignat. He's the director of the Chamber of Commerce at Houghton Lake, and he dropped by the outdoor fair and asked me if I could hook him up with somebody who could, who could get him into a bow, because he had never shot a bow before. So, I, of course, we took him to the bear archery booth. This one maybe set about 45 pounds. Okay, Mike. You want to try that, Mike? Give that a whirl. When was the last time you pulled a bow back? I never did. Oh, okay. <laughs> This is the first time. Oh, in macro. How do you like it so far? It's oh, I like it. I like it, but I don't know. <laughs> but you can't pull it back. No, I it's can't pull it back. I think 35 for me. Okay, for I've start. got something closer to that too. There are a set of muscles for archery, you know, that you normally just don't use. They don't get any work across your shoulders and back. That don't get used. It doesn't take long to build into it. In almost no time at all, you can be shooting comfortably, shoot 50 arrows, and become really fairly accurate. What's the lowest draw weight you have here? I think what I have here, and I'm not again, I'm not sure on the weight. I think I'm around 35 pounds on this. Uh, the draw length is about 29 inches, and that okay. is going to be closer and a little easier to handle for Mike. Oh, yeah. oh okay, his easy. first draw with a bow. Hey, okay. round of applause for Mike Ignat. He did it. He drew it back for the first time. And like all of us in archery, Mike Ignat has a lot to learn, but who's going to teach him? What style is he going to imitate? Who is he going to listen to? Now, he probably thinks that he'd like to listen to Fred Bear. I mean, the grandfather of archery here in Michigan. I don't know. Talking to Fred about his technique is interesting. Show us the, the Fred Bear form. What's the classic form? Well, I don't have an iron, but my classic form, it's, it differs from most people. I'm aiming when I draw. And when I get it back here at, uh, at full length, it's gone. It's like shooting a slingshot. I keep, you can't describe the system, but that's the way it works. It's like when a, you pull it back, you I'm aiming. pause and draw. Or pause when I get back to full draw, it's gone. It's called snap shooting. Snap shooting. You and I don't recommend it. I hope nobody tries to copy me because well, I taught a... myself. And uh, it's, a little, it's a little bit hard to master that technique, but it has served me very well. Well, I'm not a snap shooter by any means. That's taken many years of experience for Fred Bear to develop. But my technique, I learned from Phil Grable. He's a bow designer and excellent art. He's the president of the PAA, Professional Archers Association. 
and he's a member of Pope and Young. He taught me a far different technique than Fred Bear uses. This is a technique of sighting. Now right here, I have a sight pin. This sight pin is set for about 20 yards. And the way I use this sight pin when I shoot, I don't look down the arrow. A lot of archers pull the string back and put it on the side like anchor by the side of their cheek. And they'll use the arrow, look down the arrow or look down their sight pin. The way I do it is shoot three fingers under the arrow. When I knock an arrow, I'm not putting my fingers on both sides like this because there's a chance to wiggle, to move, to put some stress on it. I do three fingers under. So I draw back and I'm not even touching that arrow. Now when I use the sight pin, I'm lining up my eye with the sight pin and the string in the middle. And if I'm perfectly anchored and my arm is straight, that's a perfect triangulation with the target. Right there, the string is lined up against my dominant eye and right in the middle of the lens. The whole key is holding the bow steady while the arrow travels from this position when it's fully drawn until it clears the arrow rest. That, my friends, is the whole ball game in shooting an arrow straight. Because you want to, what you do with the bow after the arrow leaves doesn't make any difference. But the hard part is releasing your hand, relaxing this part of your body and holding the rest of it straight so the bow doesn't move. Now, I learned my technique from Phil Grable, like I said. He was up at our bow camp two years ago, and this is when he introduced Ed Groves to archery. And actually, there's quite a bit to shooting a bow consistently and accurately. First thing you do when you get your anchor, your string back to your anchor, you have got should have that sight aimed right on what you want to hit. Okay, so I don't bring it up and pull back and then aim, but I'm trying to aim as I'm... It, you're doing it right in one single motion. Okay. You're making your draw and you're putting that pin that you decided to use right on that target immediately. And right. When that string hits your face, you should have the sight pin in there on the target and then get your anchor, your fine anchor, and tighten it in with a sight in that target all the time. Okay. That's Besides perfecting your technique and working on the back squeeze and the release and so on, another thing you have to do is practice your hunting techniques. Now, here at home, in the backyard, sometimes I shoot from 10 yards, 15, 20. Sometimes I step back to 25 yards. With my one sight pen, I have to compensate. But this is what bow hunting practice is all about. That was a terrible shot. Terrible. Remind me never to do this on television again. <laughs> but uh, when you practice, you can practice in the woods. You can go through a field archery course. Phil Grable uh, does a lot of that in the fall, shooting uh, silhouette targets. And these just might be a cardboard target uh, against a straw bale in the woods. But it's a good idea to practice, not only uh, with different targets at different distances, but from different positions. Kneeling, uh, sitting, standing from a tree, the different positions you shoot from. Another thing that you want to do is, is shoot into a target that is going to stop your arrows. Now this arrow, I want to get this out of here right away. This is a total embarrassment for me to do this on television. But this type of group is what we're looking for in deer hunting. What I'm using is this piece of foam in front of straw bales. And I know when you were in high school and going to camp and that type of thing, you shot into a straw bale. The problem is with the compound bows and the fast bows of today, after prolonged shooting, you're going to put an arrow right through the bale and the neighbors won't be too happy. So what I use is a foam target like this and the arrow hardly penetrates. Another advantage of a foam material like this, what we learned up at uh, Houghton Lake, Alex Weaver is one fellow who supplies these types of things to archers. An advantage of this is you can shoot your broadheads. That's the arrows, the tips that you shoot when you're deer hunting, the real killing tips for big game. And when you practice, you should practice with these broadheads at home because field tips like this have a different balance than the broadheads. They fly differently, and you might find when you're shooting this weekend, trying out your broadheads into the target, that they fly erratically. You might have to buy different arrows, get some different broadheads. Now, the problem is when you shoot them into the target, can you pull them out? That's, an adva that's the advantage of a foam target like this. Of course, right now, what I'm doing, leading into the last weekend, is, is practicing with my target tips. I'll get out the broadheads uh, uh, this weekend, just a couple days before season, and do the fine tuning on my techniques. You know, you should not forget that you should do a little bit of practicing, if you can, from your tree stand in the woods. Tree stands are the most popular way of bow hunting in Michigan. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. I think the main one is that you can get up and you can see the deer. 
Um, when you're on the ground, the advantages there is that you are, frankly, a little more well hidden from the deer. You have more behind you, more in front of you, and despite the fact that you're at eye level with the deer, you're not silhouetted against the sky the way bow hunters are in tree stands. Any movement in the tree, if you have sky behind you, that's going to be able to be seen by the deer. So the ground has it as advantages. Your arrows will fly a little bit differently when you shoot from a tree. You shoot a little bit higher. So what you should do is, when you're in the tree, put some apples on the ground, a few targets, and take a few practice shots. Sometime when you're in the tree, just to make sure you're on. Now, what about hiding from the deer? What about camouflage? Well, at some bow camps, uh, it seems that the camouflage paint is in the rage. <laughs> See, a lot of bow hunters, including myself at different times, will put on a lot of camouflage paint. I don't prefer to use it. I like to hunt just myself versus the deer. Frankly, I don't like to clean that stuff off at the end of the day. But there's an alternative to that that I prefer using, and that is a camouflage insect suit. This is good at this time of year if we, this weather's cold right now, but if we encounter any mosquitoes, it can keep the mosquitoes away, and the camouflage netting doesn't interfere with my shooting. I can draw the bow back against that netting and have no problem uh, with the aiming and releasing. So those are a couple techniques to keep yourself hidden from the deer. When a deer comes in to your tree stand, this is the biggie. This is the thrill. This is what it's all about. This will get your pulse going. Uh, and this little spike buck you're looking at right now is a bit nervous. The reason it's nervous, I'm up in the tree with a camera, but it's nervous because the wind is blowing. And on a windy day, deer cannot use their eyes as effectively as they can when it's still. The whole forest is moving. The trees are wiggling. The leaves are moving. They can't see you move as well or see any uh, danger, a, a fox, a coyote, or whatever they interpret as a danger. They also can't hear as well. Deer's ears are large. Uh, they're very adept at picking up all kinds of sounds, but when the wind is blowing, that's canceled out. Now, there's one faculty that a deer has. We don't have highly developed at all, and that's our nose. A deer can wind you, scent you, and the ball game's going to be over. What is happening right now in the woods is bucks are starting to look for the does that are coming into heat. Does will be coming into heat or maybe in a couple weeks now, some of the bigger does. The bucks tell that by their noses. They, they try to find the does that are emitting uh, the pheromones and the odors that indicate that they're coming into heat and want to be bred. Now, you can attract bucks to your area, possibly under the right conditions, by using what is called sex sense. Uh, scents that are taken from does, from the urine of does th that are in heat, and they can actually maybe interest the buck and bring him closer to your tree stand. Now, there's a lot of these scents on the market that, that tell you to apply them on your boots and put them in little spots out by a tree and so on. But Clark has developed something which he calls scent spence. It's a dispenser for scent, which really is the most supremely logical way of making a trail like a doe in heat. This little system you got, sounds logical to me. Obviously, your hospital-type background, medical background, uh, this is what they use on IVs and things in hospitals. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, and what you're doing is putting the scent in a bag mm -hmm. and letting it uh, drip out behind you as you walk. That's right. So that would be like a, a doe that's in heat. Here, in fact, I'll turn it on here, and we'll show how this works. The shut off clamp. Shut off clamp, okay, flip that on. Now, there, that's too much. Yes. You just regulate it? What One you? drop every eight, 10, or 12 feet is all you need. Okay, so like this, it's stripping right now at about two, three, four, about every four seconds, is that? Every every two to, to four seconds, depending on whether you're going upwind, crosswind, up a hill, down a hill. Now this is gonna drip continually. That's correct. If I, if I leave it like this, there, okay, there's a drop there. Mm -hmm. There's time for another one. Okay, so this is what I use to leave the trail going through the brush. That's right. Okay. But I remember, if a deer doesn't see you, doesn't smell you, doesn't hear you, doesn't know you're in the area, you're probably going to get one shot and one shot only. That's what all this practice is about. We line up and try to do everything we've learned and remembered. Close enough. I'll take that one. But if the deer does sense you, does smell that you're in the area, it's going to go through a couple different characteristics. It, a doe's especially will stomp their feet. They'll stand there, they'll look at you, they'll try to pick you up with their eyes, with their ears, with their nose. And if your wind isn't blowing in that direction, they're liable to stomp. And if they start to snort or lift their tail up, flare their tail out, 
that deer is gone. It's putting a signal out that something is wrong in the area. There's some danger around, and it'll leave, and that's the last you'll see of it. So chances are you're not going to get a second shot. But you need to practice, put in a lot of practice, especially this weekend. It's all the time we have. I tell you, it's going to be enjoyable being out in the woods. I sort of hate to think about getting a deer on opening day because then the hunt would be over. Maybe I'll sandbag a little bit. Then again, maybe I won't. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't even practice anymore. You know, I think that shot right there is a keeper. You know, I think everybody's mind is on hunting right now, but there might be a few fishermen out there who are interested in the report. I have Bill Swagler from the Michigan Travel Bureau on the line. How you doing, Bill? Fine, Fred. How are you? Is anybody still fishing? There's a lot of fishing going on, Fred. Uh, I imagine salmon are the big one. Salmon's the biggest right now, especially on the west side, uh, the Sable River in Ludington. They took 1,298 fish yesterday in the snagging area. The mm. only slow spot right now is at Croton Dam. They are not coming up the river. In fact, they even have some steelhead reported down in the Manistee River in the lower portion. I'll be done. Uh, inland fishing. Any report northern pike, perch, walleye? Uh, about the closest I can get to inland Fred is I was up last week uh, and this last weekend in Drummond Island and we took about three of us took about 65 northerns we got a real nice nine and a half pounder a wow. 15 pounder and uh, the three uh, friends of mine caught 150 perch in about uh, three and a half hours and they were going eight to 13 well it's safe to say that fishing is good all over the state one last question for hunters what about the leaf drop Leaf drop, Fred, is about 5 to 10 percent, and the only place is the northern western portion of the UP. That's what I would guess. Well, thanks, Bill. We'll call you back next week for more details. Good talk. Okay. Well, that's the rundown. There's a lot of fishing to be had out there. Hunting conditions are improving, and we have some hot outdoor headlines, too. Well, the headlines are hot this week, Fred, but they do include some bad news up in the northern portion of Lake Huron. Biologists are starting to see confirmation now about what fishermen have feared for some time. The lamprey seems to be back in northern Lake Huron. Uh, biologists uh, think that maybe uh, they've started spawning in the St. Mary's River. If so, that'll be a hard population to get under control. Things do not bode well right at the moment as we speak for, uh, for the restoration of lake trout in northern Lake Huron. Proposal B, that's the Hammer Recreational Land Acquisition Trust Fund Act that is on the ballot for this uh, November. If you're not registered to vote, you might want to take this opportunity to get out, get registered, because if this passes and is inked into the Constitution, it will guarantee hunting and fishing land uh, acquisition for years to come. Milliander Marsh was dedicated. That's one of the largest projects by a non-governmental agency just north of Lansing. was dedicated yesterday, Wednesday, and I got a chance last week to talk to Dennis Fijikowski, Executive Director of the Michigan Wildlife Habitat Foundation about this project last Marsh week. It's about 200 acres of new wetland. It's an area that was drained about the turn of the century and for the last 80 years has been drying up more and more and woody vegetation has been taking over the marsh. So what, what, what then did you decide to do with it? I see dike. You put in uh, 1.3 miles of dike. Had to cost you a bundle. Cost a lot. We, we've got uh, 7,000 feet of dike, as you said, four rock spillways, and some water control tubes and structures so that uh, the Department of Natural Resources, when we're done, will be able to manage this marsh, uh, the water levels in the marsh, to optimize its value for wildlife. The waterfowl digest is late this year, but it is out now. It was late because of the federal government changes in the goose season. It is out now, and DNR is busy distributing it this week. Duck season begins almost statewide, except for southeastern Michigan. On Saturday coming up and on Monday, there's a whole host of seasons beginning. First of all, on Monday, the archery deer opener is statewide, open statewide on Monday. On, uh, also, the snowshoe and the cottontail season opens up in zone one and two, and that special archery bear hunt opens in the 16 counties in the northern lower peninsula. A lot of seasons coming up, and a lot of us are hoping to put a lot of game in the freezer this fall. It should be a good hunting season, and a few people will get an elk permit. Mm -hmm. Ed, we have a letter about the elk. Mm -hmm. From Roger Ellis of Jackson. He says, don't shoot the elk. They are too tame for being wild animals. I have seen several small herds in northern Michigan. You can almost walk right up to them. It's just a shame that everything that is beautiful, man can't wait to get his gun out and shoot it. Roger, foul ball. Now, that your last statement there shows me that you don't really have an understanding of hunters and, and, and why they hunt. But let me address the first thing, first question here about uh, the animals being tame. Now, we got a letter today. It just came in from Fred, Fred Williams of Onaway. 
He farms up in the Pigeon River country, and he sent us a picture, he said, of an elk that he caught. He says, all you need, uh, no outside aid, you only need a strong will, quick feet, and most of all, a cooperative elk. This elk that you're looking at right now is one that you might call tame, Roger, but it undoubtedly has brain worm. There's no way you're going to get close to a deer or an elk or a wild animal unless it's sick, and that's one problem that, that we have with the herd up there. There are other problems and other re biological reasons for the hunt. One, the competition with deer. These elk are massive, you know, six, seven, maybe 800 pounds, and they eat a lot of food. But let's go to another picture that Fred Williams sent. He farms five to 600 acres at the edge of the Pigeon River Forest, and he says that he wants the problem animals removed. They are a problem to farm as well. But now this question of shooting beautiful things, come on, Raj, that's not why we're out there hunting. All animals in nature are beautiful, pheasants, grouse, everything we hunt, and, and we really revere and love wildlife. The reason we hunt these, the only reason to shoot them is because we're going to put some meat in the freezer. And I venture to say that 99 plus percent of the hunters this fall are out there hunting and shooting animals because they're going to utilize them. That, to me, is the justification for hunting. Now, Raj, let's see if you know the answer to this question to our outdoor quiz. How many women purchase hunting licenses in the United States? A quarter of a million, 500,000, one million? Think about that. The answer, nationally, over one million women purchase hunting licenses, which proves the outdoors is not just a man's world. The outdoors maybe isn't just a man's world, and neither is the kitchen just a woman's world That's either. Right. But when it comes to game jerky, you're going to turn I'll it over you to me. Do it. I know. See, <laughs> we have a recipe here that Kathy's kind of skeptical of. That is taking a piece of meat, using it for a snack, and cooking it so it ends up looking like this. Maybe not too appetizing. Uh, it's dried meat, and this is dried venison. I'm going to show you how to make it, Kathy, and maybe okay. I can change your mind. In here, I have marinating some venison strips. These are strips of lean meat that don't have any fat on them or any cartilage. I lay them across the rack like this. And uh, they've been yeah. marinating in a combination of 50-50 Worcestershire sauce and soy sauce. That's a half and half. You could do just soy sauce, just Worcestershire sauce, or maybe some other marinades if you wish, but I think that's tasty and tangy. Now, I'd like you to put a couple spices on there. I'd recommend some Lowry seasoning salt on half of them, and we'll take some of this potato salad seasoning on the other. There's a whole array of other ingredients. I like to add a little black pepper. Lemon pepper is good, a garlic powder, a salt. In fact, there's other things that you can use as well, um, but you got to do it to your taste. Now, when you get this sprinkled on, Kath, uh, Not all these pieces are big either, are they? No, well, they're various sizes, but, uh, well, we're going to try them out and see who likes okay, the biggest ones. Well, there's all kinds of seasonings we can put on, but I want to show you the cooking process after you have it seasoned. Take this rack, put a pan underneath because it's going to catch the drippings, and we're going to dry it out in the oven. Put it in the oven, turn the oven to its lowest setting, 150 degrees usually when it just comes on. Leave the oven cracked like that overnight. We're going to dry it out overnight. A long drying process. By the way, these strips of venison came from a lousy piece of meat. I recommend well, using thanks. a good one. Yeah, this is a piece of the shank. See how that connective tissue right. and the fat? You don't want that on there. I trim it off totally. I get a strip of meat and I trim that silver skin off and peel it back like that. So there's a lean piece. That looks good. This is what I would use. Now, we're going to try this. We'll turn it into this dried jerky, which is seasoned try in just a minute, but now I want to show you some pink salmon that have been caught on our trophy report. Pink salmon are our smallest Michigan species, the least known, and they have spawning runs every other year primarily in the northern tributaries. And here's the number one pink salmon of 1983 caught by Donald Dunning of Sault Ste. Marie. It weighed 5 pounds 13 ounces. It was caught mid-September last year on a daredevil in the St. Mary's River. You can see why the pink salmon is often referred to as the humpbacked salmon. Also tied for the number one pink salmon in 1983, this was an inch shorter, also 5 pounds 13 ounces, caught by Elmer Schleiss of Pembine, casting a little Cleo in the Manistique River in Schoolcraft County a year ago this month. But you know, we do have a dandy northern pike caught just a few weeks ago by Robert Gilreath of Lake Linden, 25 pounds 4 ounces. It hit a river runt trolled in the South Portage entry at White City in Houghton County. And for this 46-inch trophy northern caught just a few weeks ago, we'll make Bob Gilreath our Michigan Outdoors Master Angler of the Week. They're eating the jerky, even Kathy, and what's the verdict? 
Great. It's right. good. Isn't it good? Good stuff. It's really good. This the the potato salad seasoning though really adds something to the That turkey. does seem to be the winner. That seems to be the favorite. You really like this. Yeah, I mean I used to go for the salty stuff, but that's because that's a nice taste to it. Milder. One, one thing about this jerky, it's dried, it's not cured. You have to store it in a plastic bag, but it's you know, it'd be decent to eat out in the blind. Mm -hmm. Real outdoorsy, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. This afternoon, why don't you make up a whole bunch of it? We're going duck hunting Saturday. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is in the Club Digest, by the way. The news one the new one is out, and many of you probably have it already. Address coming up at the end of the show if you don't. Ed, let's go to the outdoor calendar. Okay. Oh, good shooting, and you know, maybe I won't have a chance to get a deer. A lot of hunters won't get a chance to get a deer this year. Maybe 10, 15% will be successful, but all of us will be having a good time. There's one tradition that we have up at Bull Camp. It's an awful lot of fun, something you might want to consider instituting, that is the hat shoot. If a hunter misses a deer at a certain yardage, what we do is we put that hunter's hat on the bale of straw the next day, pace off the same yardage, and everybody gets one shot at the hat with their broadheads. A lot of hunters up there who have a lot of holes in their hats, and I admit that I've had a few holes in mine in the past too. But it's something that's enjoyable, adds to the camaraderie of bow hunting. Actually, the camaraderie, being outdoors, seeing the deer, being a part of nature, rather than being a part from it, is what bow hunting is all about. <laughs> 